So we're going to break bread today, thinking about Psalm 72, which we've just um, just read. But before we do that, we're just going to um, going to start with a prayer, and I'll go through all your many prayer requests. And as ever, my apologies if I overlook anybody; it wouldn't be intentional. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you, the Judge of all, through the Lord Jesus, and we pray, Father, that you will open our eyes now to the Psalm that we we've, we've just read about Solomon and about your kingdom and we pray that you will open our eyes that we might see the wonder of it all and that we might be deeply challenged to give our, our heart our soul our very best for the things of your kingdom and of your dear son please father forgive us all where we fall short of that commitment that we would love to have we pray father for the strength from your spirit in the lives of each of us please be with the situation that I, I discussed. Please be with those concerned there. And we pray that you'll you'll be with Luke and help him to quit nicotine and help us all in our in our struggles against weakness of various of various types that, that we have, that we might be more than conquerors through him that loved us. We pray for meetings of people whom we might be able to engage with the good news of, of your son and of your kingdom. As Ian said, we, we pray that we will be better witnesses, that you'll give us the opportunities to, to do this. We pray for Gaylene and her, her petition uh, and for the whole issue of children in care. We pray for the new government that we have in the UK and whatever that might mean for we who are believers in the things of your kingdom and who are under your kingship and your leadership. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will be with those near and dear to us, that those who are not with you might turn to you. We think, Father, of Mike's daughters and they're getting married and the wisdom in how to relate with our loved ones who are not believers or not believers anymore or who are lukewarm. Pray likewise for Hazel's children, uh, that you will bring them to, to you. And we just pray that that we might be there for for all of them. And as Tamsin said, we, we pray that we might keep having a heart for people. And we love you, Father, for the way that you have such a heart for us all the time when we are so weak, generally. Please be with all those who are getting baptized, as, uh, uh, as Jocelyn mentioned. And we pray, Father, that, that, that really you will simply help us to to be spiritually minded as uh, as Kossam was was saying and to to be in control of our thinking and gird up the loins of our minds as the apostle peter would put it we think of aya after the car accident and her and her mum and the driver and that you will pour out your grace and your healing into that situation so heavenly father we we pray that we might look forward more earnestly to your kingdom about which in a way we have just read and that we may look forward to that time and, and that live we might live that life now so that we might live it forever. Please go with us, Father, for the Lord's sake. Amen. Right, so Psalm 72, which starts off by saying this is a psalm for Solomon. And uh, some Bibles say it's a psalm of Solomon, but it's a psalm for Solomon because at the end of the psalm, it says the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. So th this is David praying for his son Solomon. And just to bring you all up to speed where we're up to at the moment in, in going through um, in going through Solomon's uh, David and Solomon, David <clears throat> has messed up really, and at the end of his life, he, his, all his various sons, they're all trying to be king. And then when he's in the last year of his life, his wife Bathsheba, who, who young woman at one point that he'd had an affair with the girl next door and murdered her husband and so on she manipulates him she manipulates david to say that her sons david's son solomon shall be king and until that point you haven't heard anything about this solomon at all and then in the last year or so of his life as we saw in those chapters in chronicles david starts making a load of speeches about Solomon, saying, oh, actually, you know what? When God gave me the promises that I'm going to have this messianic son who would be the begotten son of God, you know what? He actually said it was Solomon. He named Solomon by name. 
And Solomon is going to be the ruler not only of on my throne, but he's going to be this messianic ruler who's going to live forever and have an eternal kingdom, which is not at all what God promised. And we saw earlier how David's last words from God are in 2 Samuel 20, 23, where he says that a future Messiah will come and that, and then David says, yeah, and my house, my family is not so with God and humbles himself. And yeah, unfortunately, after that, he goes on to make all these statements about Solomon, which I suggested was simply not true. He's got this obsessive uh, desire to see Solomon building a temple and being the Messiah. And God had told David, I don't want you to build me a temple. But he goes ahead and, and gets all the materials ready for Solomon to build this temple. God said, no, you know, I, I dwell in humble hearts and I'm going to build you a house in the sense of a family through my son, who will be your son. And this was fulfilled wonderfully in the birth of the Lord Jesus when a descendant of David, Mary, became pregnant by God. So that the child that was born, as God said, I will be his father and he should be my son, but he'll also be your son. God had said to David, this will happen after you have slept with your fathers. This is a long future descendant. And at the time, David understands that and says, wow, you've spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. But like all of us, you can get to a, a point, a, a peak of understanding. You can get to a very low point of humility before God. But then you go back to your old narrative. And this is what David does. And I'm afraid this psalm for Solomon is David putting all his expectations onto Solomon, that Solomon is going to be this wonderful messianic ruler who lives forever and has this eternal kingdom and is the man of peace. Well, God had named Solomon Jedidiah, which actually means basically God loves David, beloved, um, God's love. But David insists on calling him Solomon, Shlomo, which means man of peace. And this whole psalm that, that we've just read gives the impression of this wonderful kingdom of peace. And of course, yes, the Solomon, Shlomo, the, the man of peace. But Solomon starts well in the sense that he asks God for wisdom, and then he wisely judges between two prostitutes, who are arguing about whose baby actually died one night. But after that, it's all just hopeless for Solomon. And by the end of his reign, he is abusing the population so that when he dies, the people come to his son, Rehoboam, and say, look, your father abused us and whipped us. Um, could you just lighten up a bit? He marries a thousand women. He has multiple relationships with gentile women and his wives turn away his heart he, 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 to idols he does build a great big temple for yahweh but then he builds a whole load of idol temples all around it and he he loses his faith and we're told that he turned away from god and he has lots of opposition to <clears throat> to his kingdom <clears throat> various adversaries arise uh, etc it's not a united kingdom and the kingdom splits up into two after his time. And then he writes, in my opinion, the title Nihilism of Ecclesiastes, where he says that, you know, uh, th this God stuff is just not, not worth wasting your time with. Just get on and have a decent life if you can. And that's, you know, it's a day at the races and that, that, that's the end of it. You know, once it's over, it's over. Enjoy it while, while you can, but it's all going to finish. And, and that's it. End of story. So I read Ecclesiastes. And <clears throat> what a sad, tragic fall. And previously, I used to be very cross with Solomon that he was a man who was given everything. He was given wealth, wisdom, power, any woman he wanted. He got everything, but he still turned away from God. And yes, that is awful, and he was awfully wrong, and his fall is tragic. But... <clears throat> I do now see that actually he was set up. He was set up to fall by David. It's one of the many weaknesses and wrong things that David did was to set up his son Solomon to be a failure. 
because he puts and projects onto him all these expectations. You're going to be this. You're going to be that. You're going to live forever. You're going to have a, a worldwide kingdom. And no, that's not the, no, Solomon was not that. And the one good thing he does at the start of his reign, when I guess he's confused by all this as a young man, is to say to God, please give me wisdom. And that's why God was so thrilled with that request. But I think that's about the only bright spot on Solomon's path, in, in my opinion. So this Psalm 72 is very similar to coronation hymns that were used in the surrounding nations. David clearly has written this at the very end of David's life, in that last year, when suddenly Solomon has become uh, a, a factor. We never heard of Solomon apart from his birth. He never heard anything about him until Bathsheba manipulates David to pronounce her beloved son Solomon to be the next king. And then David starts saying, oh, you know what? God actually said this. Well, God didn't say anything of the sort. It's not recorded at all. These are all David's claims. And when we read at the end of this psalm that the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended, you can read that in various ways. But remember, there are plenty of prayers of David ascribed to David later on in the book of Psalms. And I think that could be saying that, yeah, this is not, the, the book of Psalms is not chronological. This actually was the last prayer of David. Yeah, this is what he wrote at the very end of his life. And he's totally obsessed with this son, Solomon. And he he so wants Solomon to, to have this messianic kingdom. He's totally focused on Solomon rather than on the things of the kingdom of God and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is what the promises were all about. The promises to David were all about that. But, oh, no, he puts it all under Solomon. It reminds me of people that I know, I'm sure you do, who, <clears throat> whilst they are still believers, the latter part of their lives is, is so focused on their kids, on their grandkids, that they've lost, actually, the focus on the things of the kingdom of God on the name of the Lord Jesus. People say family first. <clears throat> well, I'm also a family guy, and I'm not saying family's not important. Absolutely not. But family is not first. The Lord Jesus comes first, then your family. And David is an example of a, a man who in the latter part of his life was just totally focused on his narrative that he had created in his head about Solomon. And it didn't work out. You know, Solomon was not a man of peace. Israel did not have peace. And he did not kindly rule over his people. He abused them and whipped them and got them involved in building his endless building projects that he was obsessed with. So David says, God, give the king your justice and your righteousness to the royal son, that is, to the king's son. Give your righteousness to the king's son. Well, after David sinned with Bathsheba, he writes Psalm 32, where he, he thinks about this whole issue, that he has sinned, he's committed adultery, he's committed multiple murder, he deserves to die, but God, by grace, doesn't take his life. And God did that on the basis of counting him righteous when he was not. And Paul picks this up and says, David is every man, that we are all sinners, but we are counted right. Righteousness is imputed to us by God's grace. But now at the end of his life, David seems to have forgotten all about his sin with Bathsheba and that Solomon was, in fact, the outcome of a wrong relationship between him and Bathsheba, the girl next door, um, whose husband he killed because he got her pregnant and so forth. And he's lost the wonder of it all, that righteousness is imputed through faith by grace. By grace through faith. And as I keep saying, and I will say it again, that God brings man down very small sometimes. And we really get it about grace, about God's love. Wow, how kind God has been to me. But the thing is, you've got to stay down because otherwise 
bit by bit, incrementally, you, you, you just come back up to your old self-confidence and your old narratives and your old attitudes. See, God, in a sense, fortunately, in another sense, unfortunately, does not keep bringing us down every day or every week or whatever. These things happen only occasionally. And the point is to stay down. And David, I'm afraid, doesn't do this. Like, even relatively recently in his life, you know, 2 Samuel 22, he gives this speech about, oh, what a wonderful guy I've been, what a wonderful reign I've had, which is all fake, really, it's all makeups, all his own narrative. And then God puts a word in his mouth um, that, no, he that rules over men, David, must be just, and you weren't just. But you're going to have this wonderful son of God, descendant, and he will come down like rain upon the mown grass, and he is going to have an eternal kingdom. And David bows his head and says, yes, indeed, my house, my family is not so with God, but thank you. But then he just rises up again with his obsession about, about his son Solomon. Well, he keeps asking in this psalm, oh God, give the king's son justice. And well, Solomon is asked by God, what do you want? And he says, oh, I want wisdom so that I can judge your people justly. And yes, God says, well done, I'm very pleased that you made that request. And we read that quite rightly and say, yes, that's right. That was a good request, Solomon, well done. But you see, even that was living out parental expectation that his father David had said, oh, may my son be, be just and have justice and rule with justice and, and so on. Yeah, and so many times, hundreds of times, Solomon is recorded as using the phrase, David, my father, or my father David. He's obsessed with his father. He's just living out parental expectation. And over the time, he just gives up on God. He just goes off to the idols and lives a totally hedonistic lifestyle. We all see people do that. You know, very pious uh, children and very pious teenagers and very upright young men and women. Oh, mum's dead, dad's dead. Oh, sh they're, they're gone. They're, they're gone. Chuck it all away. Solomon, I do feel sorry for him. He was set up for failure. In this case, by his parental expectation that was put on him so strongly and in a sense yeah you know, we could say oh my parents set me up for failure well, maybe not maybe a good mum and dad who didn't didn't really do that but one way or another we have all been set up for failure we have so many factors against us that militate against the the spiritual life uh, this happened that happened oh well, poor me therefore i shall not go God's way. We are on one hand set up for failure, but of course God wants us to be winners and not losers. You can see it so clearly in the lives of others rather than in, in your own life. Well, <clears throat> he asks for uh, justice and wisdom, as I say. Uh, verse 2, David says, he will judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Well, yes, he does, because after he asks for wisdom in 1 Kings 3, you then read about two prostitutes that come to David, uh, to Solomon, and they're arguing. They say, look, we, we're living together in one house, so prostitutes live in brothels, right? Um, and we both gave birth to babies, illegitimate ones, I guess you can assume, and, well, one of the babies died, and then she took... Uh, my baby because her baby died so she took my baby off me while I was sleeping and she says it's hers and the other prostitute says no no it's the other way around these people were poor right prostitution and poverty go together that is why people do it For money you know? and according to the law of Moses the prostitutes had to be killed as simple as that. The law of Moses is absolutely straight. The prostitutes got to be killed or else the land will fall to prostitution. The prostitutes lead people into sin, so you've got to kill them. You've got to execute them. But it says, verse 2, may he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. So how does Solomon judge? 
He doesn't execute them. He sorts it out between them and tells them to you know, go and live in peace. And that is, in fact, justice and righteousness, not actually applying applicable law to sinners. And yet it is just. And this is something Paul talks a lot about in Romans, where he says, well, you know, on one hand, we're all sinners and the wages of sin is death, so we should all be dead. And yet we are not going to be killed. We are counted righteous. We are counted as if we're Jesus because we're baptized into Christ and we're covered in his righteousness. And therefore, there is no one who can accuse us. The judge is on our side. We're going to live forever. Uh, but he, he argues that actually that is that is legitimate. That that is not lacking in integrity. That that is not God turning a blind eye. That that is not, in fact, God twisting ethics. That is just and that is right. And that is a great mystery. If any human judge did that, we'd say, oh, that's, where's the justice in that? And so with the two prostitutes, where was the justice? Well, they were both according to the law, they're supposed to be killed. Well, they weren't. Yeah, grace trumps that kind of justice. Is a you know we're here on this point. I think <laughs> at the very frontier of understanding really what justice is, because you may say justice means applying applicable law. But Solomon was given you know, to judge the people with righteousness and the poor, the poor prostitutes with justice. But he didn't kill them. <laughs> he didn't slay them. And that's the point. And likewise with us, that you may say it's kind of not fair that I am a sinner, but I'm counted as righteous. So I shall not, in fact, die forever, but I will live forever. And I, where is, as Paul says, where is our accuser? There's no accuser. Who is he that justifies me? Oh, it's the judge himself, who is God, who is also my advocate for the defense. So he's also the judge. You know, in a human court of law, you'd say that's not justice. That's just that's bias that's just getting a guy off but when god does it actually because of the way he did it through the lord jesus which we're you know remembering in the bread and bread and the wine it is just and that's the wonder the wonder of it all and yes it is a bit of a mystery but as i say solomon getting back to solomon he failed to do this he failed to do this because by the end of his reign, he is whipping the people and abusing them. He's got tens of thousands of them in forced labor, cutting stone and everything, all geared up to fund and fuel his endless massive building projects. As he says in Ecclesiastes, I, I've got really into building and making huge parks and gardens. But he had tens of thousands of slaves uh, doing all that for him. Well... <clears throat> Verse 3, the mountains will bring prosperity to the people. The hills will bring the fruit of righteousness. There is in Hebrew an intensive plural, whereby you use the plural to talk about one singular, very great thing. So the mountains could be the one great mountain. And the great mountain that was in view for David and Solomon was Mount Zion, the Temple Mount. And so he's got this idea that, yeah, Solomon's going to build this this great uh, temple. And that will bring prosperity to the people. Well, no, he's thinking that somehow the fact you've got a temple means that people are going to be blessed. Like David and Solomon say, oh, yeah, if we build this temple, oh, everyone's going to come to it and worship God at it. No, that's not God's way. God said, no, I have the Ark of the Covenant under a tent, thanks. So I prefer to live in a tent. I don't dwell in temples made with hands. This is religion. This is religion. But you're going to have this great big temple and it's going to convert people. No. And yet in all these wishes of David for Solomon, you do see how, okay, it didn't come true in Solomon. But in the end, it will come true through the Lord Jesus. You see verse 4, he will judge the poor of the people, he will save the children of the needy, uh, and that is again, I think, fulfilled by Solomon in the way he judged the children of the prostitutes, and will break the oppressor in pieces. So what you're looking forward to in the kingdom of God is that the little people, the sinners, the, the no-hopers, the people who 
got themselves in stupid situations uh, who are poor spiritually, emotionally, various ways, that they will be saved. Yes, that is what you can look forward to in the kingdom. The kingdom of God, when it comes on earth, will not be, as it were, a land fit for heroes, inhabited by wonderful spiritual heroes uh, of faith who, who, you know, like Daniel, who who went to the lion's den and, and was saved from death or, you know, went into the furnace or the, his three friends allowed themselves to be thrown into, into the furnace and said, oh, God will deliver us, and he did. No, it's not a land fit for spiritual heroes. It's going to be a land, an eternal land, for the spiritually poor and the spiritually needy who have been saved by grace. That's the picture that you get here. They will fear you. This is David talking about Solomon while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. So he's assuming his son Solomon is going to live forever. Well, no. The wages of sin is death. And David honestly should have understood that. He should have understood the wages of sin is death. He'd sinned himself and been given the death penalty, but then saved from it. We're all sinners. But no, um, he doesn't get that. It's like a bit before he died, when Absalom's rebellion is going on, Shimei throws stones at David to show that you should have died by stoning. And David says, yes, um, God asked Shimei to do that. And yes, you're right, Shimei, sort of thing. But then at the end of his life, he tells Solomon to kill Shimei because he uh, cursed me and threw stones at me at that time. So it's like, at the time, yes, he accepts sin brings death and uh, I am a sinner. But then at the end of his life, the connection between sin and death is just out of his mind. And so he just gets this assumption that, yes, Solomon is going to be the eternal ruler. Um, and yes, he's going to have people praising him forever. Well, as I say, he, he has just put family first to a quite... <laughs> a quite bonkers extent that that he's just obsessed with solomon and he's not seeing the lord jesus who was to be born a long time after david had slept with his fathers so verse six he will come down like rain on the mown grass as show that showers that water the earth no no god's last <clears throat> words of revelation to david in 2 samuel 23 david is cut short by god when he's been praising himself in chapter 22 and god says no he that rules over men must be just and that's not you david and this one who is going to rule who is going to be your future son and my son my only begotten son he will come down like rain on the mown grass as showers at water the earth and david takes those words but applies them to solomon no solomon was not like that he abused his people absolutely and in the Proverbs of Solomon, he unfortunately uses this kind of language about his own wisdom, as if his wisdom is the dew coming down. But no, 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 it's talking about Jesus. It's not talking about you, Solomon. Verse 7, in his days, the righteous will flourish. Well, these days, the righteous don't flourish. Um, the righteous are ripped off. The, the righteous who forgive and are kind and are generous just get abused. But we will flourish. And there will be abundance of peace. Well, I've said that Shlomo or Solomon means man of peace. And, and so, you know, it, David's got this idea of my Shlomo, my Solomon, my man of peace. Well, that, that was not, God said, don't call him Solomon, call him Jedidiah. God loves David. No, no. Solomon, it had to be. When you look at peace in the Bible, peace always really means peace with God. Not political peace. No. As David seems to envisage here, there will be abundance of peace in God's kingdom. And, you know, as I say, these things are intended for Solomon, but no, Solomon failed and they were not true of Solomon. But in a way, they all are going to come true when the Lord Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom on the earth. And there will be abundance of peace with God. 
Revelation puts it another way, that man shall see the face of God. There will be no barrier between God and man. And that is what I find most attractive, to be honest, because I, I have this sort of fear, I suppose, of, of sin, although I'm confident of salvation. On the other hand, I, you know, you, you do see that I'm imperfect. Uh, you know, we all surely feel this. And I think subconsciously, our deepest, even if people don't admit it, our deepest fear maybe is of not being in God's kingdom. Our deepest fear is that we are hopelessly weak sinners who offend God. And yet that will be removed. There will be abundance of peace and we will rejoice in that peace with God. Now, that is, that's wonderful. Um, that we, in this life, have got that desire for that peace with God, but it's something you don't totally find in this life because we shall die imperfect. We shall die imperfect. And that's how it's going to be. And yet our greatest desire is to not be like that. And that will be fulfilled, this abundance of peace, a, a population, if you like, of people who all have peace with God and are rejoicing in that eternally. And he says there will be abundance of peace until the moon is no more. It means, you know, forever. He will have dominion from sea to sea, from the river, which always means the Euphrates, it talks about Israel's boundaries, from the river to the ends of the land or the ends of the earth. You could see that as David envisaging that the border of Israel would no longer just be the Euphrates, but the promised land would go to the ends of the earth. So, yeah, he's got this idea of a global kingdom with his son Solomon reigning over it forever. Yes, this is going to come true through the Lord Jesus, but not through Solomon. He had all sorts of rebellions uh, against him at the end of his reign. Well... You know, it, it is projecting all the time onto, onto his son that, you know, you will do this, you will do that. This is so wrong. Uh, of course, it is a difficult question. H how do you guide your children in the way in which they should go without projecting onto them in, in, a, in a harmful way? That is a, uh, you know, that, that is something to bear in mind I, I conclude really that all we can do with our kids is to show them and grandkids is to show them the way this is the way and this is the way that i've chosen and this is my example to you to go that way with your whole heart soul and mind do i expect you to do i project that onto you do i dream of the day when you shall be baptized in the church and in do i dream of seeing you doing ministry and standing on the podium and giving a talk no that, that's where it gets projection and, and, and the thing is kids will naturally if you're a half decent parent they will naturally want to fulfill parental expectation i know when kids are teenagers you, you you wonder about that but in a funny way kids do in the end um tend to go the way of parental expectation that's where you've got to be careful and it's a fine balance so, 10, the kings of Tarshish and of the islands will bring tribute. The kings of Sheba and Seba will offer gifts. And yes, the queen of Sheba does come to Solomon and bring him gifts. But right? you wonder whether he got sort of friendly with the queen of Sheba in order to get her to fulfill that. Yes, verse 11, all kings will fall down before him, all nations will serve him. And yes, it says this, all kingdoms brought presents and served Solomon. All the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom, and they brought every man his present. And that included gold. You may say, well, there you are, you see, it was all fulfilled in Solomon. But when you look at the descriptions of Solomon's kingdom, you see that actually that is all very surface level. For example, yes, it says that they did bring gold to Solomon every year. And they brought 666 talents every year of gold. That's the only time 
outside the 666 in Revelation, the number of the beast, it's the only time you read 666. The only other time in the Bible you meet 666 and you think, hmm, does that mean that Solomon's kingdom was fake? Yes, it does, because when you go on in Revelation to read the description of Babylon, the, the system that God hated, it's described in exactly the language of Solomon's kingdom. Why do that? The whole thing was, was surface level. You know, the Queen of Sheba comes and says, oh, wow, your servants are so happy. Your people are so happy. Oh, wonderful. I don't know. But at the end of his life, Israel come to his son Rehoboam and said, look, your father abused us. He whipped us with whips. He was a total abuser. And Rehoboam says to them, yeah, my father did abuse you. He did whip you with whips. And you know what? I'm going to whip you with scorpions. So it's, it's surface level spirituality. Verse 12, he will deliver, deliver the needy when he cries, the poor who has no helper. Well, yeah, those two prostitutes... Yes, yeah, Solomon did fulfill that to those two prostitutes. They, they were the poor, they had no help, and no one could care less. There's two prostitutes living in a derelict house arguing about, uh, you stole my kid, and there's the dead body of the one of the kiddies who died. Um, no one was interested in people like that, just like people aren't interested in what goes on in a drug den in, uh, you know, in West Croydon. Um, no one's interested. But he will deliver the needy when he cries well as i say solomon did this with the two prostitutes um but he didn't carry on doing it but the lord jesus yes you see eternally he is the one who does care about those tragic tragic situations that man just doesn't want to see and doesn't want to get to and so it says that all the kings, verse 11, will fall down before him, all nations will serve him, because, 4, verse 12, he will deliver the needy when he cries, and the poor who has no helper. So, the nations will come to the Lord Jesus, not because they are forced to, but because they love the grace that he shows. They are conquered by kindness. And this is a significant difference because it was typical if you overran another nation that they bowed before you, licked the dust and gave you their gold. But this king, this son of God, as ultimately this is talking about the kingdom and the Lord Jesus because Solomon just didn't make it. He will have all this worldwide worship because of his justice because he delivers the needy when he cries the poor who has no helper and again we're helped by solomon's example to see that yeah like saving prostitutes who the law says should be killed wading in and getting involved in the petty arguments between desperately poor people yes this is what attract will attract people so the idea that the lord jesus comes back as the roaring lion of the tribe of judah and goes around basically smashing up the earth and uh, forcing people, forcing the nations under an iron rod to submit to him, like it or not. You're going to submit to this new king who will, who will be reigning in Jerusalem. I don't think so. <clears throat> there will be great judgment when the Lord comes. And yes, yes, there will be a lot of destruction, particularly, it seems to me, in the Middle East and the land promised to Abraham. But the picture you have here, I think, is the correct one, that it's because of his grace, his wisdom, and his justice that all nations come and bow before him. That is not forced subjugation. I don't know what God would quite get out of forcing this world into subjection to him. That would just be manipulation. But people come, will come, because, verse 13, he will have pity on the poor and needy. He will save the needy persons. Verse 14, he will redeem their soul from oppression and violence. Their blood will be precious in his sight, and they shall live. Verse 15, like the prostitutes, let them live. Let these poor people live, even though they deserve to die. Now, their blood will be precious in his sight. David does talk about this a couple of times in Psalm 49. He talks about the redemption of human life being precious and when he could have killed Saul in 1 Samuel 26, 
he doesn't. And Saul uses this very idea here. He says, my soul was precious in your eyes, wasn't it, David? So, yeah, this was David in his better side, saw that people, that human life was precious, was costly, as it means in Hebrew. But David, unfortunately, did shed blood abundantly when he didn't need to. He killed loads of people who he didn't need to. He was very quick to have people's heads chopped off just for this. Oh, you brought the wrong news. I don't like what you said. Oh, come on, guys, kill him. You know, he did. He did not show that that he thought human blood was precious. And this is why when Shimei curses him, he says, you're a man of blood. And David says in a humbler moment, yeah, God told him to say that. I am a man of blood. Um, I have shed blood too, too freely. When he makes up the excuse, oh, I couldn't build the temple because I shed too much blood. Well, I think that is also his own conscience speaking there, that he realizes that he has shed too much blood. But this ruler will treat human life as precious. And um, Tamsin was saying in the prayer request about the difficulty of keeping on having a heart for difficult, sinful people. And it's very difficult. But you see, the Lord Jesus will do that and does do it wonderfully, that every human life, every human bit of blood, as it were, is precious, is costly to him. He sees the value and the meaning of the human person. So this is another angle on what the kingdom of God will be like, that it will be a time when human life is costly, is valued. Whereas actually the way people behave now, you see the way they drive, the way they reason, the way they live, it's all about me, it's not about anyone else. I don't see that other people have any value. The way people cuss each other, even in jest, there is no value of human life there. And they shall live and to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba. Well, as I say, yeah, that did sort of happen to Solomon, but he got 666 talents of gold a year. And our little antenna go up, 666. Oh, yeah, so was he actually fake? Uh, yes, he was. Um, we'll come to that, God willing, a bit, uh, a bit later, I think. So, verse 16, abundance of grain throughout the land. When I go with the King James, there will be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains and the fruit thereof will shake like Lebanon. You go to Israel, you see that those mountains there are very barren. They are rocky peaks. And the, in the image, he's saying, in those days under his rule, you will just throw a few seeds of corn down and it will sprout up on that rock and it will just wave in the wind, just as if it's in the valleys of Lebanon. The idea is that from very small beginnings, a seed sown on a, on a rock, on the top of a mountain where it can be blown away, that is usually barren, totally unproductive, that there, there will be growth. And of course, this is the whole idea that of the Lord's teaching in the, New, in the New Testament about sowing seeds, that we are to be like the Lord Jesus, who was like a, a shoot that grew up very green and tender out of a barren, dry ground, where there is no encouragement. There is no background encouragement for that seed to grow, but it's going to grow because it is the seed of God's word. And so, again, it's a bit like Solomon, set up for failure, but he didn't have to fail. If you throw a corn seed on a, a rocky height, it's got no chance of staying there and growing, humanly speaking. Environment is against it. But the power of the gospel in this figure is that that seed of God's word is planted in hard human hearts. We're all hard-hearted by it nature it seems to me but it grows because it is this super seed because of god's blessing and so this is what the kingdom of god will be full of it will be full of people who were seeds thrown on a rock in a hard place who had no chance of growing but who do grow 
And that's every one of us. You see, you can blow me a background. Yes, actually, yeah, life was kind of stacked against you. You were born under a bad star. You, you, you did have it all against you. Yes, spiritually speaking. Everyone is the same, actually. Even if you say, oh, well, but he had wonderful parents who brought him up reading the Bible and all that. Yeah, that's that, that's also a hard place because what are you going to do? Live out mummy and daddy's parental expectation? No, one way or another. One way or another. You know, oh, he was abused when he was a kid in Sunday school by, by some older brother who should have known better. I don't know, he married this woman and... She was supposed to be a believer, but she turned out to be an awful lady. And you, you can say that all your environment was against you, and it was. And when you talk to druggies, alcoholics, they, they, they come out with all this, oh, you know, I'm in this position because you wouldn't believe what happened in my background. This was that, and blah, blah, blah. Dad was a terrible bloke, just came home to beat me up. My mum was a crack addict, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and I don't doubt all the hard environment stories. But you see, the seed can still grow. And that is the significance. There should be a handful of corn in the earth that's planted on the top of a mountain. where Normally it's going to be blown away. It's got no chance to grow. But it will, and it will bring forth fruit. That will wave in the, in the breeze like it's in a valley in Lebanon. And as I say, this ties in with the whole theme with, with Solomon, that he was set up for failure. But he didn't have to fail. We're all, if you want to look at the cup half empty, we were all set up for failure. Well, 17, I do find difficult because this is David talking about Solomon. His name will endure forever. His name will continue as long as the sun. Men will be blessed in him. Septuagint there says, all the families of the earth will be blessed in him. All nations will call him blessed. Uh, no, no, it's God's name that endures forever. It's God's name that will continue as long as the sun. And, you know, he, he finishes off in verse 18 and 19 by saying, oh, well, all praise to Yahweh. Blessed be his glorious name forever. Uh, yeah, you like throwing that in, David. Oh, yes, all praise to God's name forever. But he's just said, Solomon's name will endure forever. His name will continue as long as the sun. No. God had said to David, don't build me a house. I will build you a house. And he also says in the Chronicles account, and I will make you a name forever. And that name was all going to be through the name of the begotten son, who would be the Lord Jesus. No, not Solomon. No. So he is really confusing the things of God and the things of his son. He's obsessed with Solomon. His name's going to last forever. He's going to live forever. He's going to have an eternal kingdom. You know, it's like these parents who talk about their kids. Oh, my, my daughter, she's so talented. Oh, she's, she's so beautiful. She's so talented. She's got the mind of a rocket scientist. Rah, rah, rah. Well, Maybe, but she lives in a council flat in Thornton Heath or Crystal Palace. And um, yeah, she lives on benefits. And um, <clears throat> yeah, well, she's a druggie. And um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, she, you know, it's all in the eyes of the, the doting parent or grandparent or whatever. So I'm afraid David just falls for this. Uh, and he, he's, he's saying that my son is going to be the promised seed of Abraham. And he says, so you've quoted the Septuagint there, verse 17. All the families of the earth will be blessed in him. All nations will be blessed in him. No, no, this is talking about Abraham's great seed. Not about your son, David. It's talking about Abraham's seed, and you are applying that language to Solomon, and you are wrong because you have lost your focus upon the Lord Jesus. And yet reading some of his Psalms, David definitely understood an awful lot about the Lord Jesus. And in fact, in the New Testament, some of those Psalms are quoted and we're told, yeah, David was talking about the Christ when he said this. But at the end of his life, he loses that. And as I say, it reminds me of people who remain believers, they're not atheists anymore, but their whole focus is on their kids, on their grandkids, and that's their what they live, breathe, think 24-7. No, family second, not first. The first focus is you 
on the Lord Jesus, the love of your life, the love of your life, the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you, who died for you and rose again. And yes, everything else flows in a natural way from, from that. So, he died for me, and that, as I say, takes over everything. Uh, and this is why we take the bread of wine, to focus us back on him, that he died for me. Uh, and that is a totally personal thing between him and me that demands everything from me. Absolutely. My whole soul, my whole heart, everything. And everything else, literally everything else, is secondary to him. And we're not living out parental expectation, no matter what your bad background, no matter how you were set up for failure. He beckons you on to live for him, to love him, to die for him, and to live forever with him and for him. So the bread represents his body given for us. Um, let's give thanks for the uh, for the bread. Um, uh, Mike Flaherty, are you in a place to give us a prayer for the uh, for the bread? Sure. We'll bow our head. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace, Lord, uh, your love that you would give us your dear son. Such a wonderful example for us, Father, that his, um, he gave his whole being to honour you. And as we take the bread now, we, we remember that he said that this is his body. He, uh, he brought his body into subjection to you. He turned away from all um, fleshly desires to honour you in the way he lived his life to the extent that he gave that um, gave that body up to death, Lord, that we may have life. Father, we remember him now. We remember his great mission, his great um, his great life in service to you and to, in service to us also as we take the bread. Amen. So the bread that is a symbol of his body given for us. Well, we're going to um, give thanks for the um, the cup, and afterwards um, we'll close down with a prayer. I mean, Tamsin, would, would you like to give the last prayer? Would you like to give us a prayer at the end? Have a think about it. Um, meantime, uh, Phil Martin, could you give thanks for the uh, the cup? Sure thing. Eternal God, our loving Heavenly Father, we just thank you that... There is no human being who can be draw, cannot be drawn towards you and your love for that person. And you just demonstrated that so generously in the provision of your son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. And so now as we <clears throat> take the, the wine, symbolising that the blood that he willingly outpoured for us, the life that is in that blood he allowed to die for us. We can hardly believe that that, that is the case, and we certainly know that we weren't worth it. But in your eyes, we are, because you love us. And so we remember him now in that provision, and we ask that you will you give us the strength and keep us faithful till either our end of earthly life or to his return, if that comes beforehand, so that we may all be together with you and with him forever and ever. Amen.
Well, Tamsin, would you like to give us a prayer? It's okay if you don't. You're muted at the moment. Tamsin, you're muted. I think oh. I've done. Am I, can you hear me? Yeah, I can now, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Father, um, we just come to you this morning, Lord, with a, with a heart of worship for you, Father. We thank you that you have given us all a place here where we can come and be ourselves, that we can come under the blood and the bread of Jesus, that we can be refreshed, renewed, and empowered in the fellowship with each other, Lord, that we can go out and face the world in the state that it is in, Lord, and it is a hard world that we, we are in. We have our physical and emotional and spiritual sufferings, and then we every day come up against the onslaught of, of a godless generation. So, Father, I thank you for this place. I ask that you bless everyone who is gathered here today with the desires that you have put in their heart, Lord. Strengthen each and every one of us, Lord, that we may glorify your name, that we may not bring you to shame, Lord, that, that um, you may just smile down upon us, God. So until we all meet again, Lord, just keep us safe, Lord. Keep us faithful, Lord, and just bubble up in our hearts, Lord, with gratitude for you. Thank you, Lord, for this teaching. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh,